All right, how about this? Are we fine now? Miss Barbara? No, you couldn't see me at first. Can everyone see and hear me? Just want to make sure we're clear. All right, we should be up and running clear now. I don't see any transmission issues here. Um, you guys let me know if you're able to see and hear now at this point. No sound yet, but can you see me? Okay, no sound, but you, uh, let's see. All right, let's see if I can get the audio going here. Audio, let's see, we got the... Okay, so Steve, you can hear? Hear and see, sight and sound, testing. All is clear? Okay, all right. It worked, your prayers work, all right. So <laughs> without further ado, I do apologize for that. Things happen and uh, out of my control. My computer got taken over by a GoPro camera. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get into our study uh, while we're here. Uh, let me see. All right. Let's start off with prayer. Uh, dear Father, we thank you so much. You're always gracious to us. Um, we trust you, especially in these times, Lord, where faith in your word and in following your ways and obeying your commandments, Lord, is a rarity. So I pray, Father, that we would lean upon your large affections and that we would trust in you. Help us and give us understanding as we open up the word today. Um, let all questions, if possible, be addressed. And I pray and ask that you would lead and guide us. We thank you for these opportunities in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, last week, we did a question and answer, and I had uh, Brother Barry on. And it was basically just um, questions were already asked and set up, and then we had some that were sent in, and we were simply addressing them. But we're going to focus more today on going through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to show from Scripture why God has called us for such a time as this. And the questions that were being asked last week, we're now going to go through a Bible study format in more detail. So... I'm going to pull up here and we're going to see if we can go ahead and get a, um, let's see, let's try this side view here and see if we can get the presentation for you guys to see. All right, let's go here. Uh, give me a second and we'll pull up the actual presentation, which is here. And um, all right, let's make that bigger and me smaller, right? That's what we want. Let's see if we can get it right here. How about that? Okay. Everyone got that, so we're clear. So I want to have that available. And when we go through the slides, you're going to find that some of the Bible verses are already provided, and so we can read them together. Others will have to pull up, and you may have to open up your word because um, it might be a task for me to get them on screen. But we're going to answer 10 questions today, and 10 of these questions are were taken out of the 75 that uh, we're going to be addressing over the next um, several weeks with Pastor Barry Still. But I want to cover these 10 that were touched on so that we can have a biblical basis for every single thing that we believe and teach and advocate. So what does, a, what does the term Adventist mean? We're going to look at that. Now, this is taken from the dictionary. So anybody that has a good dictionary, you can go and actually validate this. But it means a member of any of several Christian denominations that believe Jesus' second coming, it shouldn't be an apostasy there, and the end of the world are near. That's the definition of an Adventist. And we find that in scripture in Matthew chapter 24, 42 through 51, in Matthew chapter 25, you're going to find that Jesus had prophesied that there would be a group of people here on earth right during the time when he's getting ready to come back, and they're going to be expecting his coming. So these scriptures bring out the Adventists, and then we're going to see why it's important for us to understand the Advent history, as well as Seventh-day Adventists, because there's a distinction between the two, but at its foundation, you're going to find that you cannot, you, you cannot dispense with one or the other. They're both important as it relates to Bible prophecy. All right, 
So let's go forward here. And even as I'm speaking right now, there are many that are anticipating the second coming of Christ. So it's not limited to Seventh-day Adventists that are expecting Jesus to come soon. There are others also that are expecting the Lord to come. But we want to make sure that we are prepared for that coming. And why did God raise up a movement that um, that's referred to in Scripture as the remnant that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So we're, let's look at that as we go forward in our presentation. Now, let's see here. All right. Now, pay close attention to Matthew 24, 42. It says, and this is when Jesus was giving his disciples an answer to the question concerning his coming, his second coming in the end of the world. It says, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So this prophecy here, which Jesus was looking ahead of time in the future, he was giving counsel to those that are going to be looking for his coming. And one of the things that he clearly brings out is he says, watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Um, so we want to make sure, according to verse 44, that we are ready, even though we may not know the specific hour that he's coming, we want to be in a state of readiness continually. If we're not in a state of readiness, you're going to find that he's going to come upon us seemingly as a thief in the night and we'll be caught unprepared. So that's why it's very important that as Adventists, those anticipating the second coming of the Lord, that we take heed to the counsel that's given here in Matthew chapter 24. So Adventists are people that's simply anticipating the second coming of the Lord. Now let's go a little farther. In verse 45, it says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord have made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So look at 45 and verse 46. Jesus pronounced a blessing upon a specific group of servants or those that are anticipating his coming. Why is he pronouncing a blessing on them when he comes and finds them doing a specific type of work? What work is that based on verse 45? It says, them that give meat in due season. 47, here's the promise. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant say, shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Now let's pay close attention to this. Adventists are those waiting on his coming. You got one group that are giving meat in due season. Now we're not going to go that deep into that because we're talking about simply defining what Adventist is. But in the Bible, the scriptures are referred to as meat and milk. In this case, there's a blessing pronounced upon those Adventists that are anticipating the second coming of the Lord, that are giving the meat of the word because the season for him to return is right now. Therefore, they are focusing on the meat of God's word. And when you study what the meat of God's word is, you're going to find it is the present truth. OK, so let's go forward. And here it says. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Now, those who are not giving meat in due season obviously do not have an understanding of the present truth. Therefore, it's possible that they are going to be or not be in a state of preparedness or readiness. And when it says they say in their heart, that means it's not being verbalized. So these are men and women 
that are professing or anticipating the coming of the Lord, but they're not verbalizing in their heart that they believe that the Lord's coming is delayed. In other words, they're putting it off sometime way in the future, which prevents them from making the necessary preparations and making sure they understand the meat of the word so that they can not only share it with others, but they then themselves can partake of the truth and be sanctified by it. This is very, very critical and important. All right, now let's continue here as we go on. By the way, the presentation, are you having any issues uh, seeing it or is it clear? Is there a, is anyone, is anyone getting any kind of um, issues with the transmission of the actual slide? I just want to make sure here for those in the comment section, if you can put it's clear. Okay. Somebody said it's very clear. So you're not getting any flickering or anything like that. If not, that's good. We're good. I want to go forward. I just want to make sure that I'm not uh, hindering you guys. Some say it's blurry. Some say it's flickering. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. That's what I needed to hear. Okay, let me see. I'm going to address that for a moment and let me see if we can actually help that. And you guys let me know if this actually if this actually helps here. Give me a second here. All right. Let's see if that works and solve some of the problem. So to make sure we're good. Oh, it's well now. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Let's continue here. Thank you so much, Sister Benet and uh, Facebook user. If you're uh, not purposely trying to um, uh, hide who you are, if you're on Facebook, you're going to have to put your name with your comment because I, at the present, I cannot actually see who you are. So I would have to address you as Facebook user. Um, thank you. Now let's go and continue here. Okay. Now it says, in Matthew 24, 49, and she'll begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Now, two groups here, those that are giving meat in due season that are watchful and preparing anticipation that the Lord is coming. So their life and the decisions that they're making and uh, um, their day-to-day -day activities are demonstrating that they are pilgrims here and that they're not settlers because they believe that their Lord is coming back soon and they have to give a, a, an account for the talents that have been lent to them. On the other hand, there's a group of people that are uh, supposedly anticipating the coming of the Lord, but they begin to believe that the coming of the Lord has been delayed so much that they begin to eat and drink with the drunken. Now, who is it in the last days that is serving wine to all the inhabitants of the earth in order to put them in a state of drunkenness so that they will not be ready for the coming of the Lord. Remember, the Bible says that all the world is going to wonder after the beast. And we'll go more into the details of who that beast is in a future study. But most of you actually know out there who the beast is. So these winemakers, which is the actual craft of Babylon, we read that in Revelation chapter 17, they're brewing up wine, which is a mixture of truth and error. So they're serving that to the people. And while those that are anticipating the coming of the Lord that are giving meat in due season, the other class that's anticipating the coming of Christ, they begin to actually eat and drink with those that are drunk. They become intoxicated with the wine in ba Babylon. And rather than join with those that are giving meat in due season, that understand the present truth, which we understand to be the three angels' messages, they begin to smite. Now, if you look in scripture, when Jeremiah was prophesying at the time in which he was anticipating the approach of Babylon, they turned on him and they begin to smite with the mouth. 
So this smiting is they begin to actually ridicule, persecute, mock, and begin to speak evil of those that are giving meat in due season. Are you following me? That's the condition that the Messiah prophesied would be here on earth between the two classes of people that claim to be anticipating the Lord. All right, let's go farther here. I hope that's clear. This is covering who are Adventists. See, it's a lot deeper than what we touched on last week because we're going now beneath the surface and identifying from the word of God the two classes of people and the condition and mindset that we're going to see amongst those that profess the false Christ and that are anticipating. This year, in Matthew 25, 1, we have a parable, which are the teachings of Christ. Now, notice what it says. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. These ten virgins represent the professed church. Again, Adventists, and they're anticipating the coming of the Lord. So they're going out to meet the bridegroom. Jesus identified himself to his disciples as the bridegroom. He said, as long as the bridegroom are with them, they need not mourn. But when he's taken away, they then will begin to fast. And so Christ himself is the bridegroom in which the 10 virgins are going out to meet. Now, notice here as we continue. Now, I hope that clears up what are Adventists. And we'll touch later on Seventh-day Adventists because that's significant. But we know from scripture that Adventists is simply those that are what? Anticipating the coming of the Lord. Now, notice here in chapter, uh, question number two, what is the difference between Seventh-day Adventists and Adventists? Here's the answer here, and we'll look at the text. Seventh-day Adventists are those Adventists who continued on after the passing of time on October 22nd, 1844, which was the end of the 2,300 prophetic days shown to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. They followed Christ, who is the bridegroom, by faith into the holiest of holies and beheld the Ark of the Covenant which contained the seventh day Sabbath seal. Now, for those that might be familiar with the study, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of that you that don't, I'm going to give you a quick crash course to get you up to speed. There's a prophecy in the book of Daniel. In that book, Gabriel is dispatched to show Daniel or interpret to Daniel the vision that he was given in chapter seven and chapter eight. He's shown 2,300 prophetic days. At the end of those 2,300 prophetic days, he's told that the day of atonement will take place when the sanctuary is cleansed by the high priest. In verse 17 of Daniel 8, he's told that this vision that he's shown is going to be at the time of the end. So those that were um, um, anticipating the coming of the Lord at the time of the end, they were entrusted with this message as they began to study the book of Daniel and Revelation, and they seen that the 2,300 prophetic days brought them to the Gregorian October 22nd, 1844, which is equivalent to the 10th day of the seven Jewish month, which is Tishri, the set the 10th. You following me there? That is called the Day of Atonement or Day of Judgment. And we'll look farther into that as we progress to questions eight through 10. I'm sorry, uh, 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 questions three through 10. Now, notice here. So there was a group of Adventists that were proclaiming the coming of the Lord, the prophetic times can Daniel. It was the 2300 days also, the, the, the seven times of scattering, of, uh, uh, of scattering and gathering. They were teaching all the prophetic time periods that would bring them to October 22nd, 1844. There were those when Christ did not return on that day because they mistook the cleansing of the sanctuary for the earth. They thought the sanctuary was the earth 
all the Adventists at that time thought the sanctuary was the earth and that the cleansing of it was the destruction of this world by fire when the Messiah comes. They mix Malachi chapter four up with Malachi chapter three, when you go back and study that. Malachi four deals with when Jesus, Jesus comes back and he's going to purify the earth with fire. The wicked are destroyed with the brightness of his coming. The Malachi 3 deals with Jesus coming, not to the earth, but to his holy temple to sit and refine Israel as high priest. Two different cleansings. Now, notice here. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to go to 1 through 3. Notice what it says. It says, thus the heavens... And the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it or set it apart, uh, set it apart for holy for holy purposes. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, question. At this point, how many Jews... Gentiles, black, white, Hispanic, yellow, how many covenants, et cetera, were in place when this happened right here? I want you to think about that for a moment. Those in the chat, if you can answer that question, how many different races of people and denominations and covenants were in place in Genesis chapter two, verses one through three? Does anyone know? I'll give you a second to think about that. Now, the question is, there was none. There was Adam and Eve. This was the seventh day of creation before sin had entered into the world. And God himself had implemented and set in place the seventh day Sabbath. Jesus tells us why this was done. I'll turn there. Let's turn there. Chapter two. And we're going to look at verses 26 and 27. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me, Mark, and we're going to look at chapter two, and let's key in here on verses 27, and we're going to look at 28, Mark 2, 27, and 28. Now, notice what it says in Mark 2, 27, and 28. Jesus is telling us the reason why he actually made the Sabbath. It says here, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for who? For man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is Lord also of what? The Sabbath. So God himself, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And it was made for the benefit of man. Mankind is the translation of that Greek word there. It's not limited to the male counterpart of the woman. It's it's talking about all humankind, mankind. So I say that to say this, the seventh day was always made for God and his people, his people. Now, when you go to Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12, which we're looking at now, notice what it says. And this is a prophecy concerning Sabbath restoration. Notice here, and they that shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shall raise up the foundations of many generations and thou shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now, there was a breach made in the covenant. And this particular breach was an attack specifically towards the fourth commandment. And guess what the fourth commandment is? It's the seven day Sabbath that was established at creation and also written by the finger of God on two tables of stone on the first tables. It was the man of sin, a system of religion and paganism that was brought together, referred to as the papacy, that actually came and thought to change times and laws. So Isaiah is a prophecy that at the end of time, during the period when the Adventists are anticipating 
the second coming of Christ, there's going to be a movement to where there is a repairing of the breach that was made in the covenant. And they are going to restore the paths to dwell in so that God's people will have a clear way to the holy city, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, notice here in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath or Shabbat, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Here's the blessing and the promise. Then thou, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this very prophecy, when you go and you study the entirety of Isaiah chapter 57, 58, and 59, you're going to see that contextually is talking about the end of time. So at the end of time, as we're anticipating the second coming of Christ, those Adventists, are there after the passing of time in October 22nd, 1844, they seen that Christ had moved into the holiest of holies. And now the temple of God was open in heaven and they seen there the Ark of his covenant. They seen their obligation to the 10 commandments and that specifically the fourth commandment was being uh, uh, trampled upon, set aside, and that the man of sin had thought to change it. Therefore, they embraced that which they were in violation of prior to, and then they were Sabbath keepers. Therefore, these Adventists became seven-day Adventists because they were the ones fulfilling prophecy, being called to be repairers of the breach and restorers of the path to dwell in. We're going to see why that's important later, because the Sabbath is actually connected with the seal of God. Now, Satan knowing this in Revelation 12, 17, notice what it says. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant, that's the remaining of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The early church kept the Ten Commandments, including the Shabbat. We see that all through the book of Acts, and we see it in the teachings of Jesus when he came to magnify the law and make it honorable. But in between the time period of the early church and the remnant, the man of sin, which is referred to as the papacy, he sought to change times and laws. Therefore, the truth concerning the Sabbath begin to be trampled upon for a period of time in which the Bible clearly told us would take place. But at the end of that period, at the time of the end, there would be a people that would be anticipating the second coming that would then embrace and take hold of God's covenant that had been violated and specifically the fourth commandment that had been trampled upon. They are referred to as the remaining of the woman. So notice here, the characteristics that they have is that they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. Now, we don't have to guess about what the commandments are. The Bible makes that very clear. There's 10 of them. They're very simple. But the testimony of Jesus, let's look at that identifying characteristic. Notice what it says here in Revelation 19.10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So not only would these remnant people be commandment keepers, they were given the gift of prophecy at the end of time, which would permit them then to give the people meat in due season, which is present truth. As a result of this, those Adventists that did not embrace the Sabbath and some that did, but at the same time begin to say in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. They begin to smite those remnant that keep the commandments of God and believe in the gift of the spirit of prophecy. 
That's where we're at right now in prophetic time. And that's the distinction between one of the distinctions between seven day Adventists and Adventists, the name, the seven day and just Adventist. That's the purpose of the name. The name signifies the fact that they keep the seven day Sabbath and believe in the second coming of Jesus. OK, any questions on that so far in the, in the uh, comment section? Anybody want to uh, ask any questions on those two points so far that we have it? Matter of fact, if anyone's out there that's interested in coming on, you can actually join the format, too. There's no issue there. I have no problems bringing you on. You can come in. And that way I can hear your audio and you can help ask some of the questions, perhaps, if you want to be on. Just let me know. All right. I seen the activity begin to dwindle down there in the comment section. So either you're understanding or you're disconnected. I'm not sure. All right. Let's go. Let's continue here. And I'm going to look out for the comments because I can actually see them here. All right. Now, notice here, if we have no other questions on those two points yet, we're going to go to question number three. What did the Adventists first understand and teach? OK, Sister Barbara, awesome. Amen. That means you understand. What did the Adventists first understand and teach concerning the bridegroom coming? Now, notice I said Adventists. How did they understand this message, the bridegroom coming? What did they understand as they were sharing it and giving it to others? Now, we're going back a little bit in history, and I'm going to show you because it leads up to where we're at now. Notice here, the Christian denominations, Adventists, who believed in Jesus' second coming, gave the first angel's message in announcing that Jesus was coming, and this was understood to be the coming of the bridegroom to cleanse the earth by fire at the end of the 2,300 years of Daniel's prophecy. So to simplify this, behold the bridegroom cometh. If you wanna know what scripture is referred to in reference to the bridegroom coming, it takes in the parable of Matthew chapter 25, verses one through 12. And in those parables, it was a depiction the teachings of Christ, which was a prophecy contained in parables that would show what his church would be doing at the end of time right before he came. They were saying, behold, the bridegroom cometh, those Adventists. And they thought that it was the second coming of Christ to cleanse the earth by fire at the end of the 2300 days. So let's look a little bit more at that. I don't think there's too much there to, um, to look at. But if we read Matthew 25, verses one through four, we're going to see these people depicted that gave that message. Let's look there for a moment. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit and I want to read verses two, three, and four, which I don't have here, but I want you to turn to them. Um, it says, how can we, I'm stopping, I'm paying attention to the comments section as I'm doing the study. So this is open forum. It says, if we're having conversation and going through a study at the same time, how can we communicate with you? No chat. Uh, well, if you're wanting to, during the study, uh, communicating with me with no chat, you're either going to have to come on, which I don't mind. Matter of fact, let me do this while we're here. I'm going to send an invite. into right there. That's how you can get on. So I just sent a link that brings you into the actual program. If you want to come on, you can come on and just have your audio, your voice, or you can actually come on and join the video call as well. So that's the link right there to do that. I hope that answers your question. Now notice here, it says, um, in Matthew chapter 25, we're going to look at verses 2, 3, and 4. And if you if you have, um, you know, things you want to ask me privately, I think you can direct chat me also directly if you need to convey something to me while we're doing this. But uh, please join in if you want. Now, notice here in Matthew 25, it says in verse 2, five of them were foolish and five were wise. So Jesus has simplified all those anticipating his coming by a simple parable. And he's putting them into two groups. 
See, we may have thousands of denominations, but the Bible puts people into two categories. See, we're either for God or we're against them. And in this case, it's five wise and five foolish. But we're going to see that there's a distinct difference between the two. In this case, the wise virgins, and with all their heart, they anticipated Christ's coming. They just misunderstood exactly what his coming entailed and where he was actually coming to initially. And we're going to see and clear that up. Now, notice here in three, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, notice, what did the five foolish and five wise have in common? What did they both have? They both had lamps. Now, the Bible tells us, thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto my path. So they had the word of God. But if we look carefully, one of them was lacking something. What did they not take with them that the other group took with them? Yes, Sister Benet, you're right. They all had lamps. And Sister Rachel, you are correct. They had lamps. But one group did not have something. Who wants to take a shot at that and answer? Oil. I heard someone say oil. So one group did not have oil. Now, why do you think it's important to have oil? Now, notice, where did they not have oil located? Now, this is, a, this is not a trick question, but this causes us to look carefully at the scripture. Can someone tell me where the oil was lacking? I'm going to give you a second to think about that. Oil was not located somewhere. Now, think about it before you answer. And I'm going to give you a clue. It's within the first four verses of Matthew 25. You guys, don't be shy. I want some of you to jump on so that I can hear your voice. Okay, I got an answer. Let's see if we can get a second answer. Here's the key or the hint is in verse four. Both groups had oil. I'm, I'm sorry. Both groups had lamps, but one group didn't have oil. But where was the oil missing is the question. Vessels. All right. Here it goes, chat. Vessels. They didn't have oil in their vessels. Now you say, why is that important, Brian? Why is that important? Okay, question. The word of God, is there any darkness in the word of God? No, there's not. There's no darkness, there's no evil. The Bible says thy word is a lamp. But oil has to be located somewhere specifically in order for that lamp, that word, to cause our mind, our understanding, and our heart to be illuminated or enlightened or our understanding enlightened. In this case, someone said they didn't have oil in their vessels. Now, let's go veer off here for a second. And I'm going to show you something here. Let's stop this. Actually, just open your Bible up and we're going to I want to I wanted you to be able to follow with me here and we're going to come back to this slide right here. Let's come back to the slide. Give me a second. And we're going to I'm going to take you here with me. And we want to go ahead and let's do something like this. All right. We're going to pull up blue letter here. All right. And I'm going to bring you guys into here so you can see this. I'm going to share that. All right. Okay. Now, let's see. Is that where I wanted you to know? I want you in the Bible app, not in that one. So let's go back. 
And we're going to share the screen here. And I want to bring you here. Okay, there we go. Now, they didn't have oil in their vessels. And I want to show you something. Why is this critical? Can everyone see that? Let me know. Chat, can you see it? All right, let's make it a little bigger here. All right, I think I think we 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 blow it up pretty good there. All right. So now notice here. It says, but in the great house this is talking about the house of God, contextually. There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, now that's good, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. So what two types of vessels are in the house of God? Some to honor, some to dishonor. Now, we know it's not a good thing to be dishonorable. And we understand that that which is dishonorable is going to be discarded. So when it's talking about oil in the vessel, this is talking about the individuals who are honorable and dishonorable, but all in the house of God. This is the professed church. One group within the house of God they don't have oil in their vessels. They do not have the spirit of God dwelling in them. That presents a problem because if you don't have the spirit of God dwelling in you, you're going to find that we will not have the light that's able to keep us from going into darkness, that's able to keep us from living a dark life, that's able to keep us from practicing dark habits that are contrary to truth, that are contrary to God's commandments, that are contrary to the teachings of Jesus. How do we know that? So let's make this even clearer. It's possible to hear a sermon. It's possible to be raised up in the church. It's possible to watch YouTube videos. And you can hear the truth being spoken. You can tell me what day the Sabbath is on. As a matter of fact, if it's been your tradition and custom, you might even attend religious services on the correct day. That doesn't mean anything. So did the Jews that killed Jesus. That's not enough. You can do all of those things keep feast days, you can outwardly refrain from murdering and adultery, and you can do all of those things at the same time professing Christ, but oil in your vessel is a act of, the, of God himself gifting you with the Holy Spirit, you yield to it, and it takes hold of the mind and heart, bringing the truth of God's word into the inner sanctuary of the soul, you're not just a reflector of other men's thoughts. You have personal conviction that's in line with the written word. You are cooperating with God as he's leading and guiding you into all truth and it's having a sanctifying uh, a, a power over your life. It's freed you from the shackles and enslavement of sin that begins inwardly. The thought, the inclination, and the propensity that pulls you to act and do contrary to what is written in the word of God. Without oil in your vessels, you are a slave to your nature. But the spirit of truth frees us. And Jesus told us in John chapter eight, that the truth shall make us free and we shall be free indeed. So that's the power of the Holy Ghost. It breaks the shackles that makes us slave to our own nature. 
and causes us to have no power to the suggestions and temptations of Lucifer. That's the difference between those that have oil in the lamp and those that simply have the lamp. All profess that Christ is coming. All go out to meet him. But within, there's something brewing totally different between the two camps. The actions of those with oil not in their vessels demonstrate by their decision making how they treat other people and the choices that they're making that the Lord delayeth his coming. And that individual that has that type of experience has an evil eye towards those that are giving meat in due season, that are proclaiming the present truth and giving the third angel's message that is making that trumpet to have that certain sound. Do you under, are you following me? That's the difference between the two camps. Now notice this as we continue here. Let's go back. And we're going to now look here and you want to go back over to any comments on that while we're going back over to our actual study. Any comments? Praise God. Amen. All right. Let's look at that. And we're going to go here. Share. I hope you understand that. That's Bible simplicity. That's not surface reading. And we're going to see here as we look at this. Um, we went back a little bit. Let's go forward. All right. Let's read here. And we're going to look here at the spirit of prophecy for a moment. The coming of Christ, as announced by the first angel's message, was understood to be represented by the coming of the bridegroom. The widespread reformation under the proclamation of his soon coming answered to the going forth of the virgins. In this parable, as in that of Matthew 24, two classes are represented. All had taken their lamps the Bible, and by its light had gone forth to meet the bridegroom. But while they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The latter class had received the grace of God, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit, which renders his word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path. In the fear of God, they had studied the scriptures to learn the truth and had earnestly sought for purity of heart and life. In other words, they're putting away sin. They don't want to be entangled in the things that they once love. They now hate them. And the things that they once hated, they now love. That's called transformation because they realize that Jesus is getting ready to blot out their sins, and they want a true experience of repentance and conversion in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, notice this. These had a personal experience, a faith in God and his word, which could not be overthrown by disappointment and delay. Others took their lamps and took no oil with them. They had moved from impulse, perhaps fear, perhaps because you heard some type of crusade and it stirred you up and you wanted to make sure that the plagues don't fall on you. So out of fear or the prospects of heaven are in line with your covetous heart. Therefore, you go to meet him because you want to walk the streets of gold, all the while despising and hating the rules that govern that holy place therefore hating the one that made those rules. Are you following me? It says, their fears had been excited by the solemn message, but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren, satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions. They were stirred. Perhaps the music was real good and they were moved and even cried and tears fell, but they would not make an entire surrender. They rejected that all. They grieved the Holy Ghost to the point to where it even said there's no Holy Ghost. Now notice this. 
without a thorough understanding of the truth or a genuine work of grace in the heart. Now, the Bible tells us clearly in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy what? Truth. Thy word is truth. So they didn't have this hunger, desire to go and actually study the word to show themselves approved. They weren't depending on God and the gift of the Holy Ghost in order to lead them to an understanding of the letter experience that they had, L-E-T-T-E-R, so that they can have a living experience. They were content with the commandments of God being written on stones. They didn't want them written on the fleshly tables of the heart. Are you following me? Therefore, they can bear no fruit. Now notice this. These had gone forth to meet the Lord, full of hope in the prospect of immediate reward. But they were not prepared for delay and disappointment. When trials came, their faith failed and their lights burned dim. This not only happened in the past, when the Advent brethren were first giving the first angel's message, it's repeating itself again in the present. Have you not noticed that lights are beginning to flicker? That the experience of the saints is beginning to dim, that conviction is dying, that you can barely get people to actually study together anymore? People are more interested in activities and games and excitement and pleasure than they are studying the living word of God and fasting and praying so that they can have clear minds and grasp what Jehovah is saying. People are more interested in the pleasures of this world. Therefore, they're saying in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. And that's the condition of God's people. Then, which we're going to find, brought upon them the name Babylon. And it's the same thing that's happening again now that's going to bring upon us the conclusion of Babylon, which is she has become the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues. That's what Jesus is telling us at this time. We do not want that experience and we do not want to be caught up drunken with the wine of Babylon. Now notice this as we continue here. Now, let's just make sure that what was understood there on that question, what did the Adventists first understand and teach concerning the bridegroom come up? They understood that Jesus was coming to the earth to cleanse the earth with fire. That's how they understood that. But oil in their vessels, we're going to find, prevented them from reaching the point to where they began to say in their heart, the Lord delayed this coming. They waited patiently in order to understand clearly what the truth concerning the cleansing of the sanctuary is. Now, notice this as we continue. Now, was this expected event of the exact time in which the bridegroom would come and that led to the first disappointment foretold by prophecy in the Bible? Most people are aware that there was a group of people that had studied the prophecies in Daniel, and they believed that Jesus was coming in 1844. So we don't need to rehearse that anymore. Most people understand that. For those that don't, we can catch you up at a different time. But was that event actually prophesied in scripture? Or was it simply a group of people that did something back way when that had no prophetic significance? Let us look closely here. A command and a blessing or let's look at the answer here. Yes, God had already foreseen that the Adventists, this is before seven-day Adventists, would understand the sanctuary to be the earth and would look for him by the spring of 1844 AD, which would bring them to the tarrying time spoken of in scripture. A command and a blessing was given to those who took heed and waited during the tarrying time or the waiting delaying time. So let's look at that for a moment and look at these texts just a little bit. What was the tarrying time that took place that was connected with a disappointment and with the commandment 
to wait. And once you wait it, you're going to be blessed with something that transpires after that tarrying time. Let's look there for a moment. Notice here in the book of Habakkuk, chapter two, and we're going to key in verses one. Oh, hold on one second. We got a let's let uh, Steve. Are you there? I'm here. OK, so we got you on. We got your audio there. So you're shielded from the video. You good? Yeah. It yeah. gives the people another voice. So that's good. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. So here we go. In the book of Habakkuk, notice here, chapter two, verse one. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved or corrected. Habakkuk chapter two, verse two. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now keep in mind this term here, vision. Keep that in mind. That's critical. It says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Now, have you ever went to an appointment? What's interesting about an appointment? It was set ahead of what? Time. So there was a designated time in the future in which an appointment was made. So you're going to find that the vision that's being brought out in Habakkuk chapter two, verse two, has an appointed time or had an appointed time. And that time is provided for us in the next verse, as we're going to see. It says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Here it goes. But at the what? End, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, it says, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So there's a vision that's connected with a delay or a tarrying or waiting period that has an appointed time. And this appointed time is at the end. Now notice here in Habakkuk chapter two, verse three. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. I'm sorry, that should be four. And I'm gonna read that to you. Let's turn there. I put down the same text twice. So notice here in Habakkuk, and we're going to look at chapter two, and we're going to look at verse four. Notice that when that time came, that tarrying period, notice what the Bible emphasized during that delay in that waiting period. Habakkuk chapter two, and now we're keying in in verse four here. It's that small book that we barely read. That's why it's hard for us to find, isn't it? And notice here for a moment. Let's turn there. And we're right here in Habakkuk. You have Micah, Nahum, and then Habakkuk. Now notice here, we're looking at chapter 2, and notice in verse 4. It says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. That deals with pride. It says, But the just shall live by his faith. So during this tarrying time, and those that waited, the admonition was given that the just, the justified, are to live by his faith. Faith in the word was not to fail during this tarrying time. And we're going to find why that's critical. And those who obeyed this during the delay, when they thought Jesus was coming back to the earth to cleanse it with fire, when that time period was passing, they themselves had to exercise faith in the word of God and trust what the scripture said in order to explain their disappointment. Now, let's look here for a moment as we continue. Everyone clear on that? Here it goes. Here are the texts in which the early Adventists were looking at that placed their confidence in the word and they exercise faith even through disappointment. Notice here, it says in the context that this is the second coming, we're going to see, cast not away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. Just because it seems like there's a delay in the coming of the Lord, don't cast away your confidence in the scriptures. 
It says there's a reward that awaits you. Now notice here in Hebrews 10, 36, for you have need of patience. That's endurance. It says that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. God has never lied. His promises are yea and amen. The condition is that you need patience and that we're to endure and do the will of God. Afterwards, there's a promise. Now watch this in Hebrews 10, 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he's not going to what? Tarry. Now notice this. The tarrying period came upon all 10 virgins. Matthew 25, verse 6 is still dealing with the parable of the 10 virgins. Look at what it says there. And at midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's when the Adventists actually were teaching from the vision that was shown to Daniel that, hey, the 2300 days are at their end. Jesus is coming. But it says here, and at midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. So these virgins right here were proclaiming that the Messiah is coming. Now, notice here as we continue, the scriptures here in Ezekiel 12, 22, son of man, what is that proverb that you have, uh, have in the land of Israel saying, the days are prolonged and every kazon vision faileth? Now, do you think it was a temptation for them after the passing of time when the Messiah didn't come to think that, man, perhaps, man, this vision is error? Do you see all these websites being created today that are mocking Adventists when that those that once believed the message, they're now smiting their fellow servants by saying the vision is false? That uh, Ellen White in the spirit of prophecy of, of Satan, that she had a mental disorder and she was having strange visions? That seven-day Adventists are teaching things that are way in left field that have nothing to deal with the gospel, that the vision and the, 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 the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, that they're all backwards in error. And they got all these websites and they're doing interviews. Heck, they even interviewed me. That is a fulfillment of prophecy because those very people, God prophesied through his word that they were going to do that, that they were going to draw back, that they were going to deny the faith that they once believed in. And they were going to begin to smite with the mouth their fellow servants. That's what's transpiring right now as we're having this Bible study. This vision, this vision that's brought out in Ezekiel is the same vision being spoken of in Daniel chapter 8 in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The vision will speak at the time of the end, Daniel's dream and vision. Notice here in Ezekiel 12, 23. Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease and they should no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but saying to them, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, saith the Lord God. So, even though there appeared to be a delay and that even though Jesus did not come back to the earth to cleanse the earth with fire, the event that's spoken of in Daniel chapter eight, verse 14, unto 2,300 prophetic days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The bridegroom indeed came to his holy temple. Christ came to the ancient of days. The judgment was set and the books were open. This was the opening work of the Day of Atonement, which is referred to as Yom Kippur, and Christ our High Priest is entering in this final phase of ministration in the heavenly sanctuary on behalf of you and I, the wise virgins, so that he can blot out the sins of those that have repented from their sins and have been converted through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is oil in their vessels. Are you following me? Okay. 
Now, because of this tearing time, the rebellious had attributed all visions to error or, a, or as false. But God promised that he would perform his word and the vision given to Daniel and spoken of by Habakkuk would not fail. Though it tarry, it will surely come. Jesus was first expected to come and cleanse the earth by fire at the end of the year 1843, which is the beginning of the spring 1844 Jewish month. Now notice here, as we get ready to go a little delve a little deeper here, I want to take a moment and if there's any questions, please pertaining specifically to what has been said up to this point, I want you to ask them now, either in the comment section or if you want to join in, you can come and verbalize them uh, with us here. Brian. Yes, sir. Hey, I apologize. My mic was off. Oh, no. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, we can conflate the new birth with the with the new heart um, that we were discussing earlier and true conversion versus false conversion. All right. Go ahead. Elaborate a little bit. Well, um, all throughout the scriptures, we see. Uh, OK, so Jesus taught you must be born again. Correct. So the new birth happens when you are surrendered to the to the Lord and you receive the Holy Spirit. So the uh, all the prophets used to uh, well, the one that I posted in Ecclesiastes more more pointedly says, let thy garments be always white and let thy head lack no ointment. So we were talking about the lamp and, and the, uh, the oil. Um, this is akin to the Holy Ghost. So, and you had made, made mention that there are those that have the Holy Ghost and those that do not. Correct. So, in that, um, that would coincide with false and real conversion. That's beautiful. And, you know, you know, I emphasize that because, and I'm glad you're like, uh, you know, bringing extra text to show that experience. It's indispensable and head knowledge cannot replace that. So let's make sure that we're not having a false experience. The reason why the Bible says for us to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith is because we want to make sure that our conclusions, how we live our life and the decisions that we're making are not contrary to the word of God, because the Bible says clearly that we are not to allow ourselves to be deceived by ourselves. Right. So you can be under self-deception thinking all the while that you're in the right when your fruit, your life and how you treat other people is not in harmony with the evidences of conversion. Right. So when we're honest with the Lord in that manner, he can fix us and he can heal us. The Bible says it's the sick that need a physician. So That's we right. go to the Lord humbly and we say, Lord, you know what? I want to be prepared when you come. I realize that my righteousness is filthy. I see the limitations. My flesh is powerful, but the Holy Ghost is more powerful. And the truth that sanctifies puts those things in subjection to where I delight in thy will. And so we want that type of experience. So I'm glad you're bringing that out, Brother Steve. Praise the Lord. All right. Any more in the comment section on that before we uh, continue on? Where are we at? We're at 720. And I think we've been right at an hour. Um, let's see. Let's hit this last. I, I want to show you guys because we want to make sure that we get these questions in. I want to show you something here. So, yeah, let's go. Let's try to hit a couple more questions while we're just we're still within good time. Um, why is it important for us to make sure we teach the mistaken event above in all its clarity in order to show its fulfillment in Scripture? In other words, when the Adventists had mistook that Christ was coming to the earth, why is it important that we not distance ourselves from that, but rather embrace it as an important landmark in our experience as a people? We're going to touch why. There are people that are denied this whole, they want to get as far away from those people as they can, because like the world, and the former believers in this message, they've concluded that those people were wackos in error and that God was not leading them. That's the erroneous conclusion, but we're going to see that when we take that position and stand, 
we're actually doing an injustice to the message in which God has entrusted us to give to the world. See, that event alone was what they hoped and expected personally. But the scriptures that brought them to that event and the prophetic periods and times that brought them to that event was not error. Their expectation was wrong. The scriptures that brought them to the event was right. I hope you understand that. Let's look a little farther at that as we, as we uh, clear that up. Notice here, by denying and distancing ourselves from this history, we in turn deny the scriptures that foretold its fulfillment. This history confirms that God was directing his people in their fulfillment of studying the unsealed book of Daniel's prophecy at the time of the end. It brings to view the wise and foolish and how both groups would respond to the first angel's message. The foretold delay and the event in which it pointed to at its end. So when we deny that history and we say, oh, we have nothing to do with that, we're actually robbing the people of educating them as to how prophecy was fulfilled by these men and women that had sold all, that had studied the little book that was once sealed, but began to be open after 1798, the time of the end. And they began to be led by the Holy Ghost to study the prophetic periods that would bring them to the day of atonement when Jesus clearly came, just not to the earth, but he came to the ancient of days. And we're going to see that in just a moment here. Do we understand that? Is that clear? Um, Brene wrote, 2 Timothy 3, 7, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen, sis. And we don't want to be in that category. And um, our Facebook user put amen as well. Praise God. Sure. And we got a, we actually have a, a live in-person question. So I'm going to relay what's being asked to me to you guys. I'm going to let you guys know what the question is or statement. Uh -huh. Can you clarify why you refer to 1798 as the time of the end? Okay. Yes. So the question was asked, why did I refer to 1798 as the time of the end? This is a good question. Number one, this time of the end is mentioned seven times in scripture. And I'm going to give you the text. I never get tired of saying this because this prophecy is so beautiful. When I was younger and studied it, my mind was hooked on the word of God as being inspired. The prophecies convinced me that something more than human was behind this book. And that's why 44 years now, I'm 44 years old. I was 19 when I was introduced to this message. My convictions, my belief and confidence and faith in this word and message has not died out. I believe just as strongly, stronger now than I've ever did before in this truth and this message and the experience that God gave me when he took hold of my heart, when it was in a dark condition. I have not lost sight of my savior. I've given all and I don't brag and boast. I share it to encourage that God has keeping power. Even when we're at our darkest moment and we get hit hard and we fall, God will keep you. Who shall be able to stand? Those that trust in the Messiah. That's who will stand in these last days. That's my experience. So this 1798, it was mentioned seven times. Daniel chapter seven, verse 25, it's first mentioned. It's mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. It's mentioned in Revelations chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. It's mentioned in Revelations chapter 12, verse 6 and 14. And lastly, it's mentioned in Revelations chapter 13, verse 5. Seven times it's mentioned so that we would not mistake when the time of the end would commence, which is referred to by Christ himself in Luke 21, verse 24, as the end of the times of the Gentiles. And perhaps we'll do a study specifically on that point 
in the near future. The time of the end is when the papacy had its dominion taken away, which brought an end to the time of Gentile dominion, where the pagans mixed with Christianity controlled the state and persecuted those that love God and love is appearing. His dominion was taken away during the French Revolution when Napoleon sent out his general, Berthier, to take the Pope captive. He imprisoned him in 1798, and a year later, he died in captivity. He who lived by the sword must die by the sword. He who takes into captivity must also be brought into captivity. So the very sword that the papacy inflicted upon God's people for 1,260 years from 538 AD, when the man of sin made a breach in the fourth commandment, in the covenant, all the way up 1,260 years later to 1798, his dominion was taken away and the time of the end began. And that book, which was once sealed, those portions of prophecy shown to Daniel and that Habakkuk speaks of that we went over, they began to be studied and those visions were made plain upon tables. And our people proclaimed the first angel and the second angel's message during that time period up until Christ came to the ancient of days and began his work as high priest in the holy of holies. Amen. So that's what happened. And that's I hope that I know I went a long way about answering that, but I want to make sure we got it. That's the significance of 1798. So when you deny the Advent history, you deny the proclamation of the first angel, which was the proclamation of these prophetic time periods that would bring us with no uncertainty to the event that would take place at the end of the seven times, the event that would take place at the end of the 2,300 prophetic days and it would bring them to October 22nd, 1844, which is the Gregorian equivalent of Tishri 10, the seventh, 10th day of the seventh month, which is Yom Kippur. Christ goes into the Holy of Holies and he begins the work of investigative judgment, not the execution, but the investigation. So now notice here, as we continue on the slide here, it says, these are the scriptures. And let's look here for a moment. Um, let's see. Let's touch on a couple of those texts. And I'm just going to rehearse them to you. And I want you to remember, uh, I want you to take hold of these so that we can, when we go over them in detail thoroughly, you will have them in your mind. I want to plant a seed here. Daniel 8, 17. Gabriel tells Daniel that at the time of the end will be the vision. The time of the end of the 1260 years when the times of the Gentiles and their dominion is taken away. So notice that's contained in Daniel 8, 17. I want you to understand that. Um, but let's look here. Was the Advent movement and the proclamation of the first angel's message only given in North America? Now, this is a very simple question and a very simple answer, actually. The Advent brethren gave the first angel's message which was the proclamation of time, the time prophecies that are found in the Bible that brought us to October 22nd, 1844. If you just read Revelations 14, 6 and 7, it answers the question right there. Here's the first angel's message and notice where it goes. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to who? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment. Hour deals with time. In this case, it was prophetic time that brought them to an understanding and us today to the judgment that began on October 22nd, 1844. It says, and worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. So when they gave this message, it went everywhere. It went throughout the world. Joseph Wolf, William Miller, Joshua Himes, Josiah Litch, J.N. Andrews. Um, quite a few of these brethren were instrumental in carrying this message forward. 
And if some people are interested perhaps in correspondence that shows that it was going all around the world, I can provide that for you because I've read it myself. Now notice here as we continue, it says here, let's see here. Steve, uh, did I mute you or did you mute yourself? Because I don't want you to not be able to speak if you're trying. Okay, I'm right here, brother. Okay, so you're, okay, good, good. I just didn't know if I had muted you and you couldn't talk. Okay. Oh, no, you're good. good. All right, now notice here. Are the three angels' messages, we got three more to cover. Bear with me, saints. I'm telling you, these last three, you want to hold on because these last three are imperative because they definitely affect you and I, clearly. Not to say the others don't. But these definitely do, and you want to stand by so that we can get through them. Are the three angels' messages presently being given? And if so, are they being taught correctly? Now, contemplate upon this question for a moment, because I need you to understand when we listen to the answer here. Are the three angels' messages presently being given? And if so, are they being taught correctly? Yes and no, if you look with me on the slide. There are those who presently, there are those presently who clearly understand the foundation in which the three angels' messages were laid. That's a point. Clearly, they there's people out there. They clearly understand. We are also aware that the first and second angels' messages had their fulfillment in the history during the period of 1840 to October 22nd, 1844 AD. Those men were at Venice, which are illustrated in the parable of the 10 virgins. They were the ones that first went out. They were the ones that took the vision that was made plain upon tables and they proclaimed that the hour of his judgment is coming but they understood the coming to be to the earth, which was the event, that was a mistake. But the prophetic periods and the fact that he was coming at the end of the 2,300 prophetic days, no error in that. Now notice this. So the first angel's message was fulfilled. Those that rejected the first angel's message, those Adventists, those foolish Adventists, they became Babylon, because they closed their doors and their hearts to the first angel's message, and they began to ridicule and persecute those that were giving this message. Therefore, God declared, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Paul speaks of falling as apostasia. They had departed from the faith and rejected the light that was being presented to them under the power of the first angel's message in which the spirit of truth was bringing to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now pay close attention to this. These first two angels, through the proclamation of the prophetic time periods, brings us to the third angel as it also brought them who proclaimed it. I hope everyone understands that. So when you study the same prophetic time periods that they did, the 677, the 723, the 457 BC, the 27 AD, the 31 AD, the 34 AD, the 508, which was the taking away of the daily, the setting up of the abomination of desolation, which was in the, when the papacy came into power over both church and state or nation, kingdom, and uh, ecclesiastical and religious. And it began to persecute God's people for 1,260 years. The 1290, the 1335, all of those prophetic time periods. Now, if I'm speaking these to you and you're like, what are all these different prophetic time periods? Right there, that indicates that we have a partial understanding of what was taught and fulfilled under the first angel's message, which means now that this type of study is agitating the subject, that we then must go back and study these things to show ourselves approved. 
so that our feet can be settled on present truth and we not let go of the third angel. Now I'm going to explain that to you as we continue here. So all those prophetic periods were taught under the first angel. So if we say that those men were deluded and that God was not leading them and that they were in error, that means then that the things in which they were teaching as it relates to the first angel's message in the prophetic time periods, that they were unreliable and that they are unreliable. And that, my friend, is a mistake and error. Now, notice I'm going to clear it up as we continue here. It says here, this in turn gives us an understanding and points us to Jesus's priestly ministration in the holiest of holies, beginning on Tishri 10, 1844, for the purpose of blotting out our sins during the final atonement and closing work of the everlasting gospel. Amen. Did you know that the proclamation of the first and second and third angel's message is the completion work of the everlasting gospel? It's the one Christ prophesied of in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, when he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Amen. Well, if that's the gospel that's going to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and it is contained within the first, second, and third angel's message, if I reject the first, second, and third angel's message, if I'm ignorant of the first and second and third angel's message, if I begin to smite and persecute those that are giving meat in due season as it relates to the first and second and third angel's message, I am rejecting the gospel. If Ryan, I can I interject? That, go, go ahead, my brother. Share that, please. Yes. Okay, because there's a there's a lot of ministries that are, are supposed ministries out there, and you mentioned a few of them earlier that are former Adventists that will go on on platforms like YouTube and and whatever else, and they'll dedicate their entire ministry to trying to slander Adventism. So these are people who have clearly rejected the three angels' messages, and they go so far as to say that, that Adventists believe in a false gospel. That's right. Yeah, no. And, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish that. No, it's all right. It's all right. We just we have to we have to understand what the three angels' messages are, and that they're not. It's our messages is not. It is, it is not some new gospel. It's not a new message. They try to say, oh well, you know, if anybody comes and preaches any other Jesus to you, and then they try to say. Oh well, those Adventists, they have uh, they have the wrong Jesus because their Jesus is dressed as a Levitical priest. So they'll say stu stuff like this because the, what reflects in Adventist art, for example, you, I'm sure we've all seen the pictures where where you know there's a picture of a depiction of Jesus where he's dressed in Levitical garb. So they'll try to use that as justification, saying that we have the wrong Christ. When it's in fact them that have the wrong Christ, they've rejected the three angels' messages, which is the closing work of the everlasting gospel. And, you know, that's so beautiful because the book of Galatians tells us that if any man preach any other what? Gospel, let him be what? A curse. Right. So now notice this. Either the first and second and third angels' message is correct. And it's the closing work of the everlasting gospel, as it states in Revelations 14, 6 through 12, or our accusers and opponents in the form of former Adventists, and even worse, former seven-day Adventists, along with those that are in Babylon that have rejected the first and second and third angels message. When they say that we are teaching and preaching another gospel, while they're rejecting the first and second and third angels message, they are fulfilling prophecy and the curse that's found in the book of Galatians does not apply to those that are given meat in due season. It applies to those that had no oil in their lamps and they said within their hearts, my Lord delayeth my coming. And they Mercy. began to drink with the drunken, which is that apostate whore spoken of in Revelation 17 that makes wine which is a mingling of truth and error, and she gives it to the inhabitants of the earth. That's, That's right. why they view things in that light. Now, right. 
I'm going to bring this point out. I'm going to bring it home real quick here. Notice this. We also see the Sabbath seal contained within the Ten Commandments in contrast to the image and mark of the beast. Now, this is picking up right off the previous slide that said that the first angel's message in the prophetic time periods, they bring us to October 22nd, 1844, when Christ goes into the holiest of holies. What is in the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary? What is that location referred to? It's referred to the most holy place. What was located in the most holy place? The Ark, Ark of the of covenant. covenant. Where did the man of sin make a breach in the covenant? The fourth commandment. So what's brought to view as the temple of God in heaven is open and we're seeing the Ark of his covenant, we now see the Ten Commandments just as it was given from Mount Sinai, written by the finger of God. Only this time, we see it unchanged by the man of sin because he can't tamper with heaven's constitution. His hands is too short. And notice, we by faith now are allowing the Holy Ghost to write the law into our heart, the covenant into our minds that we not sin against our creator and that we can be brought into harmony with heaven's constitution that will govern us in the everlasting kingdom. Are you following that? Now notice here, it says, however, there are others who have changed and placed these messages as being fulfilled sometime way in the past and others have removed them out of their proper place in history and placed them way in the future. So two groups are tampering with the three angels' messages. And I'm gonna talk about another group too at this point that don't tamper with it, they're indifferent. In other words, they know, but they won't teach. They know, but they refuse to take a side on the stand of right. That's a different group. But these two groups try to take these messages and place them way back during Jesus' day and say, hey, contextually, they were fulfilled there. And then another group tries to make them future. In other words, the Adventists from 1840 to 1844 and shortly after did not fulfill these messages. They are to be fulfilled way in the future. Now, they taught them and fulfilled them and we are now under the third angel, which is going to conclude with a loud cry, God's seal as we settle into this truth and we'll be prepared for his second coming, which is harvest. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But notice here, it says, um, we are presently under the third angel sealing message and all three of these messages are to be repeated and given in their proper order minus the reapplication of time as a test. So time is no longer going to be a test because in Revelations chapter 10, Jesus himself depicted as the mighty angel said that time shall be no longer. He's talking about the prophetic time periods that were proclaimed under the first angel's message. We are not going to reapply those times after October 22nd, 1844 and make them future. Now, notice this as we continue. All right, we're going we're gonna to go to the A point. Remember, we're dealing with 10, so we're almost there, saints. What are the differences between what is coming from most popular pulpits concerning the three angels' messages and the message we were entrusted with? Here it goes. Many who are giving these messages pertaining to the three angels are simply surface reading the verses contained within Revelations 14, 6 through 12. And I'm going to give some examples of that as I read through. There's a difference, and this is not everybody. We are in the minority in 2024. The majority of Adventists no longer believe in the three angels' messages, and that is a fact. We are the minority. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man cometh. And the Bible says, when Jesus cometh, shall he find faith on earth? And if he can't find faith on earth, he's not going to find righteousness because righteousness comes by what? Faith. 
and faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So toward the end of time, the minority will be left proclaiming this message and the majority will depart from the faith, which is to depart from the word of God. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits. That's spiritualism. They're going to be drunk with the wine of Babylon, and then they're going to begin to tamper with the first and second and third angels messages, as I'm going to show you. Now, let's look at this for a moment. Here are a few examples of shallow surface reading that will aid us in farther understanding that the verses must be studied in depth and understood versus simply being read and applying them to wherever we so choose in history or in the future to place them. Now watch this. Most read Revelations 14, 6 and 7 and simply define the words, fear God and give glory to him. So they read it, they go get a dictionary or they find a text to interpret, well, what does it mean to fear God and give glory to him? Well, no problem, but that's surface reading as we're going to find out. They then point to the hour of his judgment. And you may be blessed. Um, it says, and you may be blessed when it's a, uh, that's a miss uh, right there. They then point to the hour of his judgment. And you may be blessed when they elaborate that this began on October 22nd, 1844. When you have a teacher that's at least telling you that on October 22nd, 1844, that the judgment began. If you hear that, you're blessed. Now notice this, some go on to explain that to worship him that made the heaven, the earth and the sea is pointing to creation Sabbath or true worship. Now, mind you, these things that I'm saying, they're not false, but I'm going to show you how the simple surface reading has caused us to reject the truth and substance behind these messages. Let me share with you. Then the second angel is pointed to in order to describe the churches that keep Sunday, Sunday holy in place of the seven day Sabbath and believe in immortality of the soul. You say, well, Brian, what's wrong with that? Isn't that right? Isn't that the first and second angels messages? Let's look a little farther here. Even though these things above are true, they are not the exact, even though these things are true, they are not the exact fulfillment of the first angel's messages as we will see as we progress. Lastly, the image and mark are identified and explained to be the union of church and state coming together and legislating the Sunday mark. That's also may be thrown in there, which is true again, but watch this. Most emphasis is placed upon the Catholic church and the papacy as the antichrist when these messages are shared, okay? Now watch this. On the surface, it appears that we have a solid foundation when we hear it proclaimed this way, right? And all is clearly explained. But if we pay close attention, there's a big problem here. Even though the truth pertaining to fearing God and giving glory to him and the warning against the image and mark are true, these messages are not correctly understood in their full import and true fulfillment. Let us examine closely why I'm saying that. Notice here. All the above history covered in the true fulfillment of the first and second angels messages so far in this study is practically made void and these messages are then placed within the time period and framework of our own devising if we simply run with how it is explained in the paragraph that I just shared with you. Did you notice that the explanation by simply defining what it means to fear God, what it means to give glory to him, do you realize that that does not cover or, or any uh, entail uh, anything pertaining to the time of the end, what the vision was that would begin to speak at the time of the end, who it was that actually proclaimed it, and how they fulfilled the uh, uh, um, verses in the book of Habakkuk where it says, take that vision that goes on, write it upon tables so that he that run can run with it. 
we're going to find that those that did that actually fulfilled prophecy. Now watch this as I clear this up more as we go farther. As we look a little bit closer, let us ask ourselves these questions. Can we not see that all the information containing the true history and what we have covered so far in the scriptures above are made null and void when the three angels are explained in the manner being expressed that we see coming from most pulpits, publications, and articles today? Let me elaborate more. If we run with these shallow, misleading explanations above, mostly by omission, that means things are not being said that need to be said. Things are not being shared that need to be shared. And they are intentionally being le left out by some and others due to ignorance. Just like when I begin to share with you under the first angel's message, those prophetic time periods. To some of you, it resonated. To the majority of us, we have no clue. To the majority of us, it's not important. Why? Because we've been told that it's not a part of the gospel. Why? Because we've been told that the first angel's message has nothing to do with what was proclaimed by the Advent brethren during that time period. Now, notice here, I'm going to show you this as it relates to the fulfillment of the first angel. Now, it says, which removes these messages out of their fulfillment in history, we make Habakkuk. 2, 1 through 4, Daniel 8, 17, Daniel 12, 4, 9 through 12, Matthew 25, the parables with the 10 virgins, 1 through 12, and Revelations chapter 3, 1 through 3, 1 through 11, I'm sorry, and Revelations 10, all unfulfilled by the wise virgins of the Advent movement when we teach it that way. You Go and read those verses right there and show me how you can take those texts and fail or, 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 or refuse to apply them to the Advent brethren that gave the message or were first entrusted with it at the time of the end when the vision began to speak up to the time of 1840 to 1844 when the 10 virgins went forward after the signs that Jesus had brought forward in Matthew 24, the darkening of the sun, the moon and the stars falling in the parable of the fig tree. When you see these things, then the kingdom of God is at hand. They fulfilled those events and God entrusted them with the first angel's message. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Now, notice here. Who were God's people that were warning men prior to October 22nd, 1844 AD, that the hour of his judgment is come at hand, which is the Greek word arriving? Who were those people? Now, if I simply go to Revelations 14 and I read verses six and seven, and I simply define what it means to fear God and give glory to him, that doesn't answer this question who it was that actually warned the people under the first angel's message that the hour of his judgment was coming. So who fulfilled the first angel's message if I simply explain it by defining words? Number two, how would the people be prepared and warned of the judgment if the message was not first given prior to the event? It was the third angel where Jesus goes into the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant and the temple of God is open in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant is seen. That's when the Sabbath seal is brought to view in contrast to the image and mark of the beast. Christ going to the Ancient of Days takes place under the third angel. So if there was no warning given, prior to October 22nd, 1844, then no first angel and no second angel was ever proclaimed. And who was Babylon? Because Babylon came into being when they rejected the first angel's message. Now, let's go a little farther here. How would they know that the hour, which pertains specifically to prophetic time, was at hand for the judgment? How would we know that? How would anyone know to prepare for the judgment? 
if that message wasn't first given? How would they prepare for the second coming of Christ if the first angel's message was not first given during that time period? They now, will. let's go a little farther. Uh, go ahead, Steve. I was going to say there, there, there's no clear direction without it. Okay. And what Stephen is bringing out is Proverbs chapter 8, where it says, where there is no vision, check me on this, that word vision there is kazon, the people perish. See, we read that and we start talking about uh, mind mapping and uh, writing out whiteboards and your plans and your goals, and we don't understand what we're saying. That scripture applies to the kazon. When you take away the vision, the people perish, but the vision is connected to the tables and the tables are connected with those who fulfilled prophecy and created those charts so that the people can run with it and talk from those things. That information contained within the charts are the prophetic time periods and the events which was the fulfillment of the first angel's message that would point you to the third angel, the sealing message. Now let's continue here. Notice here. How could, what scriptures would they have had to understand and proclaim, which would point all who listen and obey to the event at the end of the prophetic periods? How could the prophetic charts, which we are told were directed by the hand of the Lord, and fulfilled a prophecy in the Bible to be true if we simply run with the shallow interpretations above. Now, taking um, 10 stones or whatever and making an idol out of that is what carnal-minded people do that have no oil in their vessels. The content on the stones is what's important. If I have the stones and I go hang them up in my house, if I was so privileged to have the original Ten Commandments and I went and put them up in my house, it ain't going to help me or anyone else. The information on those stones is the weight and the meat of the matter. That information needs to be hid in the heart and mind. So as it relates to the charts, you have people that have made an idol out of the charts. The truths contained within the charts show us the clear pathway on the 1843 chart, bringing us to October 22nd, 1844, so that our feet can be firmly established on the third angel's message. The 1850 chart contains all those same periods, the prophetic times, with the introduction of the sanctuary message because Christ is now in the Holy of Holies. Both of them together gives us the complete fulfillment of the first, second, and third angel's message so that we can run with it. Now I'm gonna continue to elaborate that as we get ready to close up our point. Thank you for bearing with me on this. This is a burden and it's my responsibility as well as the rest of those that know this information to teach people the correct way, not to try and please men, not to try and be policymakers, not to try and avoid persecution or to be in line with ecumenical spirits, not to be more in harmony with the Babylonians that have rejected the message, but so that you can study to show yourself approved because when Christ comes back, he's not gonna ask you, well, what did mama believe or what did your church teach? He's going to ask you about yourself. He's going to examine your garment as if you were the only person on earth. And if we don't have that gifted robe of righteousness, I can assure you we will be on the side of those that are going to be hiding and begging for the rocks to fall on them from the presence of the Lamb. Now notice this as we continue. This misrepresentation of the three angels' messages not only misleads, but it ignores plain text of scripture and the spirit of prophecy as a second witness showing their fulfillment, their true fulfillment, and how they are to be understood and presently taught or prophesied again. Now I'm going to show you that what I'm sharing with you has a second witness, which is a third witness, which is the endorsement of the spirit of prophecy. The Bible was the first witness. 
those that proclaimed it and fulfilled those scriptures in the Bible that talk about what I'm sharing with you now, that's a second witness. The third witness is the spirit of prophecy that came after these truths were laid in order. Ellen White, and I believe she was a prophet of the Lord, she was shortly after the passing of time in October 22nd, 1844, her first vision, she was shown the temple of God and she was shown the covenant. And around that fourth commandment, it was circled because the Bible teaches that it is the seal of God. Now I'm going to show you something here. Let's continue here. Here it goes. Spirit of prophecy. Many who embraced the third message, that's the third angel, had not an experience in the two former messages. Satan understood this and his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. But the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place. And those who had an experience in the past messages, that's the first and second, were pointing them the way to the heavenly sanctuary. So it's the third angel that points us to the most holy place. But it's the first and second angel's message that was given by the Advent brethren, which was the prof, uh, uh, proclamation of prophetic time that actually points us and brings us to the heavenly sanctuary. Because it was those men that went back and studied the types and seen that the Messiah on the 10th day of the seventh month that he was coming on the Gregorian, October 22nd, 1844, that that was the bridegroom coming. So as we go back and we look at that now, we understand that that was the event of Jesus going to begin the work of judgment so that he can blot out our sins so that they would not be in our mind and they won't be on the heavenly record books. Jesus cannot legally change his law of justice in which his throne is founded upon and mercy, he cannot change those two principles to accommodate the sinner. He must take the sinner, give him a new heart, a new desire, new loyalties as we trust and surrender, only possible by the oil in the vessel. And then he makes us fit citizens for that kingdom. Our acceptance of him is our title to heaven. Us being sanctified by him as we through repentance and trust and, 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 and confessing and forsaking our sins, it fits us and prepares our hearts and minds to be in harmony with the everlasting principles that will govern the new heaven and the new earth. Amen. Are you following that? So that affliction will not rise again a second time. Now let's continue here. I want to finish this out. We're almost done. 10 minutes. What is this? It says, they embrace them in their order and follow Jesus by faith into the heavenly sanctuary. These messages were represented to me as an anchor to hold the body. And as individuals receive and understand them, they are shielded against the many delusions of Satan. These are a shield against the delusions, but they must be received. The truth must be received and they must be received in their proper order. Now notice this. After the great disappointment in 1844, Satan and his angels were busily engaged in laying snares. That's traps. Watch this to unsettle the faith of the body. He was affecting the minds of individuals who had a personal experience in these things, these messages. They had an appearance of humility. Remember I told you what I said about the Lord delay of his coming in the heart? They had on sheep's, they were wolves with sheep's clothing. So looking at them, man, they kissing hands and washing toes and everything. You don't know what's going on in that, in that in that head side, the only way that we'll know whether someone is speaking the truth and whether God is leading them, the Bible says you will know them by their fruits and they will not be in opposition to truth. The carnal mind is at enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. These men use the spirit of prophecy to deceive the gullible. When you find that their life, their attitude, and their heart when they are confronted with the spirit of prophecy, when it conflict with their ideas, you will find that old Satan rise up. And you're going to find that that spirit is in opposition to truth. Now notice this as we continue. Here it goes. He was affecting the minds of individuals who had a personal experience in these things. They had an appearance of humility. Now watch this. This is the spirit of prophecy. They changed the first and second messages and pointed to the future for their fulfillment, while others pointed far back in the past, declaring that they had been there fulfilled. This is omitted in certain art, uh, articles, just so you'll know that. But this right here in Spiritual Gifts, volume one, page 166, it clearly states those who had an experience in these messages, they changed the first and second angels' messages. What are they trying to hide? They're trying to hide their prophetic fulfillment that was carried out by the Advent brethren that's contained within the charts and those that fulfilled that. Are you following me? They're making that which has been declared as solid questionable where men begin to now make up their own messages, saying and teaching things that make of none effect that which has been confirmed by the spirit of prophecy and by the word of God. Now notice this, it says here, these individuals were drawing the minds of the inexperienced away and unsettling their faith. Some were searching the Bible to try to build up a faith of their own. They want to be recognized. They want to be unique. They want to teach things that will draw men to themselves, not point men back to the truth and the faith once delivered to the saints, not pointing them to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy is your only hope of salvation as you trust in the gift and the giver of the gift. Now notice this, Satan exalted in all of this for he knew that those who broke loose from the anchor now, I'm not going to interpret for you what the anchor is. Go right back. What was the anchor? Did we read that earlier or have we read it yet? Okay, we're going to get to that. Now, notice, keep that in mind what I put in uh, capitalization. Those who broke loose from the anchor, he could affect by different errors and drive about with winds of doctrine. Many who had led in the first and second messages denied them. And division and scattering was throughout the body. Now, let me ask you this. Are there various winds of doctrine blowing right now, even within the movement? Answer that question. Yes. Everywhere. Everywhere. Are there men that are denying the first and second angel's message as was given to us as a people? Yes. Is there a division and scattering right now taking place throughout the body? And is every wind of doctrine blowing? Yes. Now watch this. I'm going to get right to the point here and I'm going to go straight to what is the difference between the early Adventists who preached the first and second angels messages and those who continued and received the light on the third? Those who remained and continued on after the bridegroom came to the Ancient of Days and the Holy of Holies embraced the sanctuary message, the Sabbath, and understood the work of investigative judgment prior to the execution of judgment that would be carried out by Jesus, our high priest. There is a judgment clearly laid out in scripture that takes place before the execution. Now, let's make this real simple. I don't know why men overcomplicate this. And it, they overcomplicate it, and it only works with those that are taking their eyes off the Lord. Because truth and the spirit of truth exposes darkness. Now watch this. What just judge would execute a man before a trial? What just judge would give someone the death penalty before any investigation? 
inquest. That it means it's examination. These are synonyms all throughout the Bible. We're ridiculed for using the word investigation. The English word investigation, inquest, actually, and examine uh, is found in scripture. Inquest and examination is found in scripture in reference to the judgment. In John 5, 22, I'm going to give you scripture. The Bible says the father judge of no man, but I've given all judgment unto the son. And in verse 27, he tells us that he's also given him the authority to execute judgment. The day of judgment took place on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur began at the end of the 2,300 and prophetic days. So it's 2024 now. 1844, there has been an examination going on, an inquest since that time. The books are being examined according to Daniel chapter 7, verses 9, 10, and 13. So what's left? The execution. Chapter 5, verse 27. Now notice this. I want to show you this, and we're going to close on this point. Look at Romans chapter 2, and I'm going to go there with you after I read the spirit of prophecy quote. When was the first angel's message first proclaimed and found its fulfillment? Now watch this, just so you don't say Brian, I have never heard of this. Where are you getting this from? Why are you teaching that the first angel's message was fulfilled by the Advent brethren? I want to make this point and drive it home just for you. Within time constraints, it's very difficult to go through all the scriptures and show these things in clarity. So I'm giving you the rapid version. In the Spirit of Prophecy, notice what she says, and this is taken from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. These are not some articles. These are the original early writings that were made. Notice here. The prophecy of the first angel's message brought to view in Revelations 14 found its fulfillment in the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844. I'm going to read it again for my opponents and to strengthen those that still believe in the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible. It says the, the prophecy of the first angel's message first, first brought to view in Revelations 14, that's six and seven for those that want to go check the scripture, found its fulfillment in the Advent movement of 1840 and 1844. In both Europe and America, men of faith and prayer were deeply moved as their attention was called to the prophecies and tracing down the inspired record they saw convincing evidence that the end of all things was at hand. The Spirit of God urged his servants to give the warning. Far and wide spread the message of the everlasting gospel. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. You see that? That's the closing work of the everlasting gospel in which the Advent brethren were proclaiming prior to Jesus going into the Holy of the Holies in October 22nd, 1844. That's when they gave the first angel's message. Prepare for the Lord. He's coming. Now notice here. Turn to Romans 2.16. I want to take you there for a second as we close up. And we're just going to open it up for some, uh, some real hard questions. I really want you guys, for those that are still hanging around, I want you to Throw the questions at me because we really need to start agitating this subject and digging deeper than this surface reading. It's not going to get us into the kingdom, beloved. Now, notice here. Um, let's uh, look at this for a moment. I'm going to go here and I'm going over. I'm just want to go to Romans 2.16. And let's look at that uh, right here. OK, here we go. All right. Notice this. Romans. 216. Now this is this is this is to clear it up. Look here. Now look at that for a moment. Can everyone see that? Okay. In Romans 216, notice what it says. In the day. That deals with a specific time. When God, that's the Father, shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So hold on. The judgment is connected with what? 
the gospel. This same judgment and same gospel is found in Revelations 14, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlasting gospel to preach unto what? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people saying. That word saying means proclaiming with a timid voice. I really don't want to share this message. With a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment. That's the first angel's message that prepares the people to receive the third angel's message where Christ goes into the Holy of Holies on October 22nd, 1844, and they'll receive the Sabbath seal. Now notice this, you've seen that in Romans 2.16. This just shows you how it takes the Holy Spirit to discern spiritual things and why our opponents, former brethren, are saying that the three angels' message has nothing to do with the everlasting gospel. Lord, have mercy on us, please. God is giving men over to reprobate minds to where the truth can smack them right in the face, where God could be here on earth like he was during his first advent, here on earth, walking the planet. They have God right in front of them, the living word, he who knew no sin, performing miracles in the synagogue from a child, excellent in scripture, understanding a character that was beyond reproach. And he would proclaim them the truth and they would attribute it to Satan. You cast out demons by Beelzebub, trying to kill and murder an innocent man on Shabbat. My smile is pain. Do you understand that we're repeating the history of the Jewish nation? We're doing the same thing and we don't see it. Our hearts are hardened. We're rich and increased with goods and think we have need of nothing. We're naked, blind, wretched, miserable, and poor. And we don't wanna be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We've attributed the closing message that's to be given to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and we've ascribed it to Satan because we're drunk with the wine of Babylon thinking we're going to skate into the kingdom. It ain't going to happen. We're repeating the history of the Jewish nation, and Christ is a stumbling block to Israel today. Turn, two last texts, and we're going to uh, open the floor up right here. Let's turn to John. And let's look at chapter five and let's look at verse 22. I'm going to show you those two texts that I just brought out. Romans 2.16 is the closing work of the everlasting gospel, bringing the view to first angel's message. Now notice here, for the father judge of no man, but have committed all judgment unto the son. Now watch this. You notice that word there, it said all, all judgment. That means both the investigation and the execution. The investigation, Yom Kippur, placing the sins on the head of the scapegoat, leading him out into the wilderness, fire, execution. Now notice this as we continue here in 27. And I've given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Anyone that does not see the entirety in the two phases of the judgment in those two verses right there, we are ignoring Romans 2.16. The first angel's message, the hour of his judgment, is dealing with the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and that's connected with the gospel. When probation closes, you're dealing with the execution of judgment. Are you following that? Now, let's go to one last text. I got I to gotta belabor this because I want you guys to be so sure of this. Turn to Daniel 7. Now, I'm going to take you right to verses. I'm going to get right to the crux. And I was just going over this with one of my brothers who does not even have the full understanding of this message. But because he has the spirit of God, he received it when we were going over it earlier. Just today, like five hours ago, we were studying. Now, notice this. I beheld till thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. That's the father 
whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Watch this. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. This is an array of witnesses. You're talking about millions of people. They are before the ancient of days, the father. But what are they doing? Why are all these people gathered around? What's so important that millions of witnesses are gathered? Watch this. The judgment was set and the books were open. Well, if there's a judgment and there's books that are open, what do you think is going on? Court is in session. But now let me ask you this. I thought the father who is the ancient of days, gave all judgment unto his son. Where is Jesus? We have no hope if we have not Christ. Where is our high priest to plead the blood? Where is our advocate and adversary? Notice in verse 13. Notice what it says in verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man with, with the clouds of heaven. He's being escorted. The Bible says clouds are clouds of witnesses. The witnesses are bringing him to the ancient of days. We're going to find out why. Because John 5, 22 says that the father judge of no man, but he have given all judgment unto his son. Now notice this. The son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near and before him. It is Christ that is examining the books during the time of judgment prior to the execution, according to my gospel, according to Paul's gospel, according to John's gospel in Revelations 14, 6 and 7, and according to Jesus's gospel in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, when he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. Beloved, let no man beguile you. Let no man deceive you and weaken your confidence through higher learning and false education and, and improper hermeneutics to try and cause you to question the validity of the message in which God has called you into. If this message wasn't true, he would have left you out there in the corner and left you in Babylon. He's called you out of Babylon into marvelous life. Will you accept it? Or are you going to then reject it and begin to smite your fellow servant who's giving meat and due season in anticipation for the coming of the bridegroom? Not this time to the Holy of Holies, but he's coming to earth to get those in which he's prepared a place for. That's right. Bring it, brother. I invite you to accept this Jesus, not the one in which the world has made up. Not the one in which the false apostate churches are trying to entice you to worship. I invite you to the true Jesus of the Bible. One that has a standard, one whose throne is established upon justice and mercy, who's ministering right now between the two cherubims between the, uh, before the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments, the everlasting covenant are unchanging. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. We got a Amen. message to give and we can no longer play church. That's right. Human policy and man's planning is not going to save your soul. I can tell you that right now. We better fast and plan around these three angels messages and ask God to come in and sup with us and make his abode with us so that we can see Laodicea is sick, and I'm the first to admit, Lord, I need remedy. I need the Holy Ghost and truth so that my eyes can be open and stay open. That's the experience we need. That's right. Not bigger buildings. Not mowing my neighbor's yard for the simply of trying to entice him to bring, give him the truth, speak the truth to him. Tell him you love him and then demonstrate your love towards him by giving him literature if you don't have lips that can articulate the truth. Give him a book. Before we close with an appeal, I want to please open the floor. I want comments 
questions, anything, share it, please, concerning what we've just went over. We got to be ready to die for the truth. And the Lord is preparing our hearts right now to lay it down if need be. See, I died a long time ago. My life, man, was jacked. And I said, Lord, you got to save me because I can't save myself. And so death, if it does come, I pray for the spirit of martyrdom. Prepare me, Lord, to lay it down. I believe your message. This world has nothing to offer me. We want that experience. Any closing thoughts or comments out there? Anybody? I got one here. I have one here. Yes. First Peter 4, 17. I've been told to turn to. First Peter 4, 17. In connection with um, the investigative um, part of the judgment. Okay. We got First Peter 4, 17, and they said it's in reference to the investigative part of the judgment. All right. Let's get rid of this off the screen. Okay. It says, wherefore, let them... 417 yeah. or 19? Okay. It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Thank you so much. That text and many others. And the only reason I don't bring out 15 and 20 texts is because I don't want to exasperate my listeners. You ever had a good meal served? Even good, if, it's, if you get fed too much at one time, you start being like, oh, it becomes loathsome. But right now we need to have an accelerated experience. I'm telling you, Michael's getting ready to stand up. And we want to make sure that we have on the garments. Thank you so much for that. Judgment begins at the house of God. And just as it did in ancient Israel, when they gathered around the sanctuary, they wanted those sins removed. We don't want to be bringing up negative, uh, old nature, uh, strong pulls for stuff. We want God to cut that stuff away, Lord, remove it to where I delight in the law of the Lord. We're asking for that kind of experience. Um, let's look through the comment section. I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. I got a, quite a few uh, comments, and then I'll let you guys go. Y'all have held in there. But you know what? It's worth it. They used to listen to Paul for 12 hours. And falling on roofs. I when 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 my wife gives studies to those people in Pakistan, they say it's God's time. It ain't my time. Losing a little sleep is better than losing your soul. Now notice this. Let me look here and see. I, I see some some comments put here. Uh, let's see here. Uh please pray for me. If you private message me, I don't. I still I don't know who that is that's asking for prayer. Oh, okay, Stephen. Okay, I'll definitely pray for you, my brother. I will do. Barbara, how beautiful he is! Yes, our Savior is lovely. He's never failed us. His mercy endure forever. It's our heart that we have to be careful about. He stays the same. He'll never leave nor forsake us, but we can forsake him. Bless God for His truth. Yes, mom. Bless God for his truth. Brother Stephen, you got any closing comments there? This is recorded, by the way, so you'll be able to go back. Look, this is, this is not edited. This is live, and I put out there what I believe. We don't hide it in the dark. I'm not trying to, like, get little secret groups and, and have these secret studies. Everything I believe I've been sharing for years and even more intensified now, it's all on video because I, I the, the truth can be scrutinized as closely as anyone wants to. Scrutinize it. It's out there. It's already That's been true. circulated. It won't be so much by argument anymore, but a demonstration of power. And so I, please go back, share it with whoever you want. Ask the Lord to give you holy boldness. And we're going to be going through these things point by point, even closer to home. Amen. Amen. Well, if there's no more comments and nothing else to be said, I'm going to go ahead and close for us. I've been really blessed by this. And, you know, I'm going to throw a little uh, jab out there. And I, it's because it needs to be said.
And this is what I truly believe in my heart of hearts. Those who have been entrusted with teaching, make sure you're teaching what's right. I'm telling you, for teachers and ministers, it's going to be 10 times worse. And give the people substance so that they have a desire to come out, whether it be on Shabbat or on Wednesday. If someone's going to travel an hour or two hours, give them something to travel for. Stop trying to make people feel good and tell them the truth. Amen. Your Father, we need your help, Lord. We need your strength. Time is fleeting. Lord, you said that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith and give a heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You said because of iniquity would abound, the love of many will wax cold. Father, warm our hearts with your word. Give us the Holy Spirit in our vessels, Lord. Let us not entertain anything that will grieve away the Holy Spirit. Bless those that have listened, empower them and give them strength. Please, Lord, we need you. I need you more than anyone. And I'm asking for your sustaining grace to keep us, please. Thank you for this message and thank you for this truth. And may these words not be uprooted by the enemy of souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Any of you that need special prayer, please just uh, message me and I'll be praying for you. My wife is a prayer warrior and she inspires me to pray even more. And I will do the same for you. Y'all stay focused and may God bless until we meet again. Um, any feedback on the mechanics, subjects or anything like that, please share it. And uh, we'll seek to pray about it, implementing that. We love you. And until next time, be blessed.